Well, I will begin then. Uh, there is a handout that uh, you can find on the website, but uh, let me put it in the chat box one more time. Okay, so uh, I hope everyone can hear me. Yeah. Uh, so let me remind you that uh, the fundamental uh, venue for getting my reading of the parts of the text that we're talking about is the chapters in a spirit of trust, in this case, the first three uh, chapters of it, and that you have different versions uh, of those available in my Humboldt lectures, both in the text and in the video of it, and at least as an aid memoir, uh, you have the handouts from those uh, uh, from those Humboldt lectures. So uh, I'm not going to try and say everything that I say uh, in those places, but but we'll instead try and uh, place those views in a somewhat larger uh, in a somewhat larger space. Now uh, <clears throat> we're starting with the introduction to the book rather than the preface, because the preface, like most prefaces, was written afterwards. And it, it's a big, long thing, which really is uh, a sort of commentary on where we've gotten to at the end, and a prospectus for the science of logic that's coming in uh, you know, as, his next, uh, as his next project. So the introduction really is where the book uh, begins. And it's worth thinking a little bit about the circumstances of uh, the composition uh, of the book uh, uh, here, though in general, that's not the kind of thing I'm gonna be talking about. I'd recommend once again, uh, Terry Pinkard's book, Hegel, A Biography, uh, which is very good on uh, these issues of sort of what was going on with Hegel beforehand and uh, during this. But it is relevant that um, uh, Hegel sat down and wrote the book out uh, longhand from, uh, we assume a set of, uh, a set of notes. Uh, we don't have uh, the notes. Uh, we know from the indefatigable labors of German graduate students that uh, the actual number of hours that he spent writing it is only about half again as many as it takes to just copy it out longhand. Uh, so basically he was sitting down and writing all day, uh, not going back and revising it. And indeed uh, he had already taken um, what was for him a substantial advance from the publisher. Uh, he had not delivered the book that he had promised to at the time that he had, uh, the publisher was threatening to sue him, which would have been catastrophic for his uh, academic career. And just as he sets uh, down uh, to do this seriously, Napoleon's armies are uh, surrounding Jena and begin a siege uh, of the city. Uh, every chapter that Hegel finishes, he sends out of the city with a courier uh, to the publisher saying, look, here's the next bit. Really, I'm going to get this uh, done. Uh, but he knew that the courier had to get through Napoleon's lines in order to get to uh, Frankfurt, to, to where the publisher was. Uh, and Hegel never heard whether any of those chapters got through. That there just wasn't enough communication back and forth. So he was sending these things out uh, uh, into the great beyond, into the void, and not knowing whether he would ever see them uh, again or whether they'd just been uh, destroyed along the way. And this was true throughout the composition uh, of the book. Famously, uh, he wrote the, the very last chapter, Absolute Knowing, uh, as uh, Napoleon's uh, troops entered Jena, uh, He'd mostly finished it and went out to see the troops coming into the city. And at the last minute, went back into his room and grabbed the manuscript now of the last 20 pages or so of the book and stuffed them into his great coat pocket while he walked around 
the city. When he came back, uh, his apartment had been trashed. The French soldiers were already in it. Uh, he realized had he left those pages there, they would have been uh, gone forever. So uh, these were very difficult circumstances under which uh, he uh, wrote this book. Uh, those of you who are writing dissertations can think about uh, how difficult the circumstances can be and still, uh, you know, still yield something like this. Um, the original title of the book and the one he sent off uh, to begin with uh, that appears at the top of the, the earlier chapters was not the phenomenology of spirit. It was the science of the experience of consciousness. And he didn't change his mind about this until uh, he'd finished what amounts to the first half uh, of the book, uh, the first five chapters through the reason uh, chapter, uh, and substantially altered the plan of the book uh, at that point and wrote the long spirit chapter, which is, uh, amounts to almost half of the book, uh, that together with the religion chapter and uh, absolute knowing. And then uh, six months later, four months later, January of, uh, of 1807, uh, he has the opportunity, he now knows that the whole book did make it to the, to the publisher uh, and he writes the long preface. Uh, sort of looking back over uh, uh, over what he did. Uh, so it's been a controversy uh, ever since to what extent he really changed his mind about what uh, book uh, he was writing. And I'll say something about this when we look, uh, when we're reading chapter five, uh, which includes his account of intention. Uh, and my claim will be given his theory of intention, his intention did not change. Uh, nonetheless, there is a big difference between the first half of the book and the second half. Uh, his concern with uh, the sea change in spirit from traditional to modern forms, that's really the second half uh, of the book. That's what the spirit uh, chapter is about. And it seems that he did not have in his mind uh, writing that. Uh, as part of the book while he was writing these, uh, these early chapters uh, uh, anyway. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna talk about uh, the introduction, these uh, 16 paragraphs, I think I mistakenly last time said 18 paragraphs. Um, I'm gonna talk about it in four parts. Uh, first, I want to talk about the uh, really the opening paragraph, but uh, the first few paragraphs, uh, which is uh, his uh, hasty sketch of his reasons for rejecting a traditional representationalist uh, picture of experience uh, and knowledge. And then the second thing I want to do is talk about uh, is have a sort of methodological interlude and talk about the hermeneutic strategy that I use to read uh, the introduction, but that is the uh, overarching strategy uh, through which I read uh, the whole book, uh, which is different from the way anyone else uh, has uh, approached it. Uh, and uh, though I uh, uh, pursue that, that methodology, that hermeneutic strategy in uh, those first three chapters on the introduction, I don't talk about it there. And, and that can be uh, uh, misleading. I think it's, it's important to have an explicit discussion uh, of that strategy. So I want to do that today. Uh, and then a discussion third of uh, under the heading of the experience of error, uh, the way in which he wants to motivate the uh, uh, distinction between appearance and reality as something internal to consciousness. 
Uh, and then finally, I want to say something about the enigmatic uh, last couple of paragraphs of uh, the introduction where he makes uh, a set of astonishing claims that uh, whenever we discover we've made a mistake, the object of our knowledge changes. It's not to be thought of in terms of the, uh, just of the change uh, of our knowledge. So, so those are the four parts uh, uh, that I want to talk about. So uh, we can look at this uh, opening paragraph. Uh, is that showing up? Okay. Uh, so it is natural to think before we set out knowing in philosophy anyway, we should think about knowledge. Uh, knowledge tends to be regarded as the instrument through which one takes hold of the absolute or the medium through which it, disco it discovers it. And that this is the theme uh, uh, of this first uh, paragraph. Um, but he says there's a problem with that. For if knowledge is the instrument to take hold of the absolute essence, one is immediately reminded that the application of an instrument to a thing does not leave the thing as it is, but brings about a shaping and alteration of it. Or to consider the other uh, allied metaphor, if knowledge is not an instrument for our activity, but a more or less passive medium through which the light of truth reaches us, then again, we do not receive this truth as it is in itself, but as it is in and through this medium. And in both cases, we employ a means which immediately brings about the opposite of, it, of its own end, or rather the absurdity lies in our making use of any means at all. Uh, to be sure, uh, it does seem an acquaintance with the way the instrument functions might help overcome this, because then it'd be possible to get the truth in its purity by subtracting from the result, the instrument's part in that representation of the absolute that we've gained through it, but this only leads us back to our point of departure. For one, if we remove from a thing that which has been shaped by an instrument, the contribution of that instrument to it, then the thing, in this case, the absolute, is for us exactly as it was before this now obviously superfluous effort. Or two, were the absolute only to be brought a bit closer to us by an instrument, perhaps as a bird is trapped by a lime twig, without being changed at all, it would surely laugh at this ruse if it were not in and for itself already close to us of its own accord. For in this case, knowledge itself would be a ruse pretending through its multifarious effort to do something other than merely bring forth a relation which is immediate and thus effortless. Or three, if the examination of knowledge, which we now represent as a medium, makes us acqu acquainted with the law of light refraction in the medium, it's likewise useless to subtract this factor from the result. For knowledge through which the truth touches us is the ray of light itself rather than its refraction. And if this be subtracted, we'd be left with no more than an indication of pure direction or empty place. Okay, so um, here, he's giving us a description of the view that he's going to oppose. This is a view that uh, I uh, caricatured last time by talking about uh, a view that saw the represented objective world on one side and uh, our subjective representings of it uh, on the other side, construed both of those things as in principle independently intelligible. In the order of understanding, we could grasp just what the world was and just what the representings were without thinking about the relations uh, between them. Uh, and either one of them could be just what it was independently of the relations between us. Uh, and the claim is uh, an account of uh, the discursive of the knowledge faculty of intentionality must somehow consist of bolting those conceptions together. And in the character uh, I mentioned last time, I said, and, and Hegel's idea, the idealist idea, is to start inside that intentional nexus 
and uh, understand the contributions made by what we're talking or thinking about on the one hand and, and what we're saying or thinking about it on the other uh, uh, analytically in terms of the functional role that things play in this um, uh, intentional nexus. Uh, that uh, account from the, from the inside, uh, that's what I want to talk about in, in the third portion of my uh, uh, discussion today. Here's the analysis of uh, this uh, uh, bolting together view. And I think, though it's not hard to see the sort of general tenor of uh, the uh, objection that he's making here, uh, the, the general tenor of it is that uh, a class of semantic models, uh, it's anachronistic to call them uh, that, people didn't use that term then, but, but a model of how uh, thought is related to beings, uh, a representational model, how representings are related to representeds uh, that has a certain shape. Uh, he's going to rule out semantically the very intelligibility of uh, actual successful knowledge of our knowing things as they actually are. Uh, and the criterion of adequacy that he's applying here, what I call the general knowledge uh, condition is that uh, if a semantic model rules out in principle, the possibility and even the intelligibility of genuine knowledge of how things are, then that uh, semantic view is a non-starter. Uh, it, it may be that we, uh, when we do epistemology, we'll discover uh, that we have to take skepticism seriously, uh, but we shouldn't build into our semantic picture of what knowing would be. Uh, we shouldn't build in the impossibility of uh, uh, such a relation, impossibility of uh, such an achievement. That, that I think is clearly the, the overall shape uh, of this uh, argument. But, but I think it's a challenge to say uh, exactly what the boundaries are uh, that are uh, of semantic models that are in his target area that he thinks uh, do semantically preclude the possibility of uh, genuine knowledge. Uh, and I think it isn't all representational models. Uh, Hegel himself will uh, give us an account of the representational dimension of uh, conceptual content. And the account he gives, starting already in uh, the middle paragraphs of the introduction, uh, isn't subject to this uh, objection. But he does think that essentially the whole tradition from Descartes to Kant, uh, using uh, Descartes' representational uh, model, I mean, the, the term is uh, Kant's, but Hegel sees him as having, um, in fact, uh, unified the picture of ideas that was common to the post-Cartesian uh, tradition under the heading of uh, representation. Uh, and Hegel clearly thinks that uh, uh, everybody between uh, Hegel and Kant was to one degree or another um, uh, subject to this uh, argument had this model. I'm going to put Spinoza and Leibniz to one, to one side uh, here and uh, think uh, mostly about Descartes, but then a little bit about how he sees Kant as uh, coming in here. I think the model, uh, which is clearest in 
Descartes is uh, that knowledge consists of representation. Uh, that uh, we know the objective world by having representings of it. Uh, so the notion of representation has what Sellers calls the notorious ing ed ambiguity uh, and uh, the right thing to do uh, with sort of all of the philosophical terms that have this ambiguity, terms like perception, uh, imagination, uh, action, uh, is disambiguate, talk about the representings and the representeds, uh, use the term representation for uh, those two things as standing in the relation of uh, representation. And the idea is that uh, the world is divided into uh, the, the things we can know by representing them, the representeds, and our uh, representings uh, of them. And as Descartes already saw, uh, a picture like that requires that there be something that we know non-representationally, uh, namely some of the representings. Uh, if to know something representationally is to have a thought, an episode of thinking that is a representing of it, then on pain of an infinite regress, there must be at least some representings that we know in some other way, that we know immediately uh, in the uh, terminology uh, Hegel will use, uh, that is not mediated by there being a representing of them uh, standing between us uh, uh, and them. If anything is to be known non-representationally, something has to be, done, has to be no known non-representationally, immediately, not by being represented by something else, uh, a representing uh, of it. Descartes' view was, yeah, those are the ideas of our mind, in our mind, which are by nature representings. Uh, and uh, we don't know them by representing them, that would be to embark on the regress, we know them just by having them. Uh, they are self-intimating episodes. The mere occurrence of them is our knowing of them. There isn't the difference between uh, what's known and the knowing of it for these representings, for the ideas in uh, our mind. So everything else we know immediately by representing it, uh, but the representings are things that are immediately grasped. And against a background uh, of a picture like that, Hegel's argument is, uh, look, you're erecting, excavating uh, a gulf of intelligibility between the object of our knowledge and our knowing of it. Uh, you're saying there are these things that are intrinsically intelligible, the contents of our mind, our representings, and then there's uh, the stuff we know only by representing it, by grasping one of these representings that's, that mediates between us and uh, the representeds uh, according to this representational uh, relation. And of course, that... Uh, picture made uh, Descartes a patsy for skepticism. Well, what do we really know about this relation now that we stand into the, uh, to the representatives? But uh, Hegel's objection, this is uh, a line he learned from Kant, that the soft underbelly of that sort of representationalist um, uh, epistemology is its implicit semantics that uh, if we can understand the notion of uh, representation, uh, Kant thought, we won't have to worry about whether we, act, we ever actually stand in uh, that relation to anything. Think about this semantic, uh, this semantic picture. 
And uh, Hegel's worry is upstream. If you think of the world as not the, the world that is to be the object of our knowledge, as not intrinsically intelligible, not in a shape to be grasped or understood, but rather having to uh, be indirectly grasped or understood by standing in a relation to something that, that we can grasp or understand, oh, then you're saying we can't really know how things are. Uh, all we can know uh, really is the stuff we can grasp or understand. Besides uh, introducing the uh, notion of a representation to uh, uh, bring together the uh, picture-like ideas of the empiricists and the sentence-like uh, ideas of the, uh, rationalists, uh, Kant gave us a terminology for thinking about that intrinsic intelligibility. He says, that's being conceptually articulated, being in conceptual uh, shape. That's what we can grasp is uh, judgeable contents where we've applied concepts. And on this picture, uh, the way things are, the represented world, uh, for Descartes, it's not in conceptual shape. It's not thinkable. It's not graspable as such. Uh, we can know about it insofar as it stands in the right relation to something that is uh, intelligible. And uh, at this level of um, uh, cartoonishness or sketch, uh, Kant says, well, nature, uh, the actual object of our knowledge, it is in conceptual shape. Uh, it, it is the product of uh, our concept using uh, activities. Uh, that's why we're transcendental uh, idealists is because in the empirical world, the world that really is the object of our knowledge, isn't separated from us by uh, a gulf of intelligibility. It is already in conceptual shape. But Hegel's concern is uh, that's not how things are in themselves. That's only how things are after our knowing faculties, the understanding, the faculty of concepts has been applied to it. Uh, uh, you've actually given up the game and said, well, we can't know how things are uh, in themselves. We can only know the phenomena, not uh, the noumena. Now, uh, one need not read the notion of a ding an sich, a thing in itself, in the way that uh, Hegel and his uh, generation uh, did. But this is the... I think the um, form of understanding of Kant in which uh, even though Kant has made the basic idealist move of saying the object of knowledge is already in conceptual shape, uh, he still thinks that involves uh, that that conceptual shape is the product of the activity of knowing minds in a way that Hegel is going to insist it, uh, it is not. Uh, and so really can no, can no more claim to have given a semantic account that makes intelligible the possibility of our knowing how things really are, uh, how they are in themselves. The absolute, before it's been dissolved, by the application of concepts oh, uh, to it on this conception. Absolute idealism is the view that uh, it's already in conceptual shape before our uh, uh, analytic powers have been uh, uh, applied to it. So, so I think that uh, the form of 
a representational picture that uh, Hegel is objecting to here, that that is uh, that he's targeting, is one that uh, uh, sees this fundamental difference between represented and representings, that the representings are in conceptual shape and graspable just as they are, and the representeds aren't, that the ultimate object of knowledge is not in graspable shape, not in the shape that after Kant we can say is uh, conceptual shape. And then he say, well, and you say, well, all we know is uh, either the result of applying our conceptualizing faculties to it, or you've got this picture, well, somehow, uh, subtract the effect of that, but then you just get the unintelligible thing uh, you started with. So uh, what, what makes this a picture of sort of bolting things together is uh, that you've got one thing, one sort of thing that's intrinsically intelligible, uh, the, the representings, the ideas in our mind, uh, because they're conceptually articulated, conceptually contentful. And then you've got the objective world uh, construed as not uh, conceptually uh, contentful. Uh, let me stop there for questions or comments about this. this is a recognizable. It's, a, it's an extremely compressed argument here. And let's say, I think the, the question is uh, exactly how to draw boundaries around what he thinks is subject to, to his objection uh, uh, here. And this is all to be motivating. You know, he's saying, well, we're gonna do things differently here. Uh, if you can't do it that way, uh, how can you, uh, how can you do it? May I ask a question? Yeah, please. Um, so this is not, a historically well-motivated question, but I was just curious whether these kinds of uh, two-stage theories where you have this, uh, where you might want to appeal to things like intrinsic intelligibility, is that, are, are problems like these arising because we have a idea that the we, that is the persons or the uh, entities doing the grasping are somehow fundamentally different from the the graspings themselves, right? So if we imagine a theory of persons which sort of co constitutes persons based on acts of content fixation, which are, so acts of content fixation are sort of prior to people, then in a way, it is, am I right in thinking that the regress doesn't quite arise in the same way? Does the question make sense? Uh I think so, and I think you're uh, motivating in a slightly different way. What I was talking about is a strategy of starting with the relation and understanding. So we're, we're starting with the intentional nexus that has as one pole, you know, what we know, and as the other pole, our knowing of it, and trying to understand those things, starting from the idea, well, from the idea that at least when all goes well, we actually do know how things are. Uh, if we start with the intelligibility of that notion and ask, well, then what constraints does that put on uh, the knower and the known? Uh, then I think that is how we avoid this sort of regress. And uh, that's what he's saying generically is an idealist strategy. Um, I mean, his own... Uh, Oh, uh, now one thing that I think uh, is worth keeping in mind uh, here is that the argument just the way Hegel has put it shows too much. Uh, it rules out things that shouldn't be ruled out. Uh, so um, uh, suppose uh, I'm given a book in Finnish uh, and I can't uh, read it. I'm given this text 
And I run it through a translation uh, program like Google Translate that just looks the words up and sort of fixes the verb forms and uh, so on. So it's it, it's not sort of understanding it at all, but it's mapping the Finnish onto the English and producing something that is intelligible to me. Now, uh, you know, Google Translate, any serious thing, but I, I can understand uh, the result of this. Um, now, that is, if we think about what Google Translate was doing there, it's an instrument operating on what it was I wanted to know. And it's altering it from being something that I cannot immediately grasp. Those Finnish words don't mean anything to me. I don't know how to reason with them. Right? I don't know what claims are being made there. And it turns it into something that I can reason with, uh, into claims that I know what would be evidence for and against them, what follows from them, and uh, so on. Uh, this instrument has turned something that was unintelligible into something that's intelligible. Uh, now, if we look at his refutation, he says, well, then you didn't really understand the original text. It was changed. You only understood the result of the change. And it wouldn't even help you to know sort of what happened, how the translation went, because the most you could do with that is undo what had been done and be left with the, the unintelligible thing. And yet there doesn't seem to be any problem with, uh, uh, with this example. Indeed, uh, that example is an instance of Hegel's own story as I understand it. That is, he thinks the objective world already is in conceptual form in the sense that it has modally robust relations of consequence and incompatibility in it. And our understanding of it is uh, a sort of isomorphic mapping of that onto our norms of incompatibility and consequential commitment. Oh, uh, the key thing for him is that both of them have to be in conceptual shape. Well, that's why the Google Translate is a translator, is because it's taking something that is in conceptual shape and turning it into something else that's in conceptual shape, uh, rather than representing something that is not in conceptual shape by representing that it's. Uh, so Hegel's own account is going to be like a translational uh, sort of account, what I called last time the bimodal hylomorphic conceptual realism says, well, you know, the concepts can be in different shapes, as it were in Finnish and in English. Uh, and uh, uh, that's going to underlie the intelligibility, underwrite the intelligibility of our actually grasping how things are. Uh, so just as written, though, uh, in that paragraph, it's not clear why Hegel's argument wouldn't go through for the translation of the Finnish text as well, because after all, it is an instrument operating on this thing. Uh, and that's what I mean when I say I think the argument, as we see it on the page, proves too much. Uh, it it uh, would rule out the kind of thing he's eventually going to say, too. Uh, that's why I said the key thing, I think, is uh, that the difference between the representings and the representeds not be construed as the difference between things that are not intelligible in the sense of being in conceptual shape and things that are. Uh, but, but merely being immediately intelligible, well, even though English and Finnish are both in conceptual shape, it's only the English that's immediately intelligible to me. So there's a piece missing from the argument. It, it, it needs to distinguish these cases in a way it doesn't. I mean, this is the first paragraph of the book. He's just motivating the way he's uh, coming. But I think you know it's worth pointing out that uh, sharpening this argument up 
so as to say, oh yes, I know what's wrong with you know Enlightenment representationalism. Uh, uh, some work needs to be done to uh, 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 to do that. But the key thing I think that he's pointing to is uh, we can't think uh, about uh, the world known as something that is not in conceptual shape, that is in principle intelligible as it is and needing to be transformed into something that is uh, in that shape. The model he's gonna have is an expressive one. He's going to say, well, the conceptual there is implicit, literally on Zik, and what we have to do is make it be something for consciousness, make it something explicit. We need to express what's there rather than represent it. Uh, that, that's to be the translational expressive uh, model. And then within that, uh, he's going to explain how conceptual content has a, a representational dimension that uh, there is a distinction between uh, the content that we grasp, what we can say and think, and what we're talking or thinking about, uh, which uh, serves as a normative standard for the correctness of what we think and say. He's going to tell us about that, but within the confines of uh, an expressive, uh, an expressive account. So that's what I wanted to say about the about the setting out, and uh, see him as filling in the first part of the cartoon picture I had. Don't think of uh, representings and represented as being of different of different kinds. The one not in conceptual shape, and the other in conceptual shape. And think about the representational relation the semantic relation and the epistemic relation as bolting them together. That, that's not going to be a, a viable account. Instead, think about how it is when uh, knowing is successful uh, and try and understand the, uh, uh, the two sides, the knowing and what's known uh, in terms of the relation, the, the roles that they're playing functionally in this uh, relation, that's the uh, the idealist uh, approach. Okay, a and we'll see uh, in the discussion of the experience of error. We'll see him explaining how he means to do that uh, uh, to begin with. There. Um, now I want to talk about the the way I read. Oh, uh, Hegel and Kant, uh, as far as that uh, goes, uh, what I call a method of semantic descent. Uh, that's uh, picking up on a phrase of Quine's, who understands the notion of truth in terms of semantic ascent, moving up to uh, a meta language. Uh, I said in my initial presentation in week one, that uh, we ought to see Kant as having invented or discovered uh, a new kind of concept, uh, that he had the idea that in addition to concepts whose expressive job it is to describe and explain empirical goings on, there are concepts whose expressive job is to make explicit the framework within which alone it's possible to describe and explain. The framework that makes it possible for us to describe and explain. Uh, the, it's a practical framework. That is, uh, these concepts are to describe what we do, uh, what we need to be able to do, in virtue of which we can uh, describe uh, and explain. Uh, but these are the pure concepts of the understanding. And the way I would want to put uh, their status is that uh, anybody who can describe and explain 
empirical goings on, in virtue of being able to do that, must already know how to do everything you need to know how to do in order to master these categorical concepts, these pure concepts of, uh, uh, of the understanding. That's a sense in which they're a priori. There's no particular ground level concepts that you need to uh, know how to use in order to know how to use these. And central among these uh, framework explicitating or articulating concepts are uh, the concepts that make explicit the subjunctively robust relations among descriptive concepts in virtue of which they can, the applicability of one description can explain the applicability of uh, another. Um, Now, I understand these categorical concepts uh, downstream from Seller's understanding of them. And so I need to say something about that. Uh, as I read Sellers, uh, around 1948, uh, he had an epiphany and uh, changed from being uh, quite a traditional philosopher uh, to embracing what he called the new way of words. Uh, he made the linguistic turn uh, then. And uh, from that time on anyway, was a giant fan of Carnap. Uh, and what he saw in Carnap was uh, that Carnap also had a class of concepts that contrasted with the concepts we use in our empirical descriptions and explanations. Uh, those were metalinguistic concepts, concepts in a metal in a metal language. This was what. Uh, Carnap and Tarski had learned from Gödel. Uh, uh, Carnap and Tarski talked all the time. In these times, they were they would see Gödel in uh, the Vienna Circle, uh, and they saw that uh, Gödel in inventing Gödel numbers. Uh, in uh, doing his incompleteness proofs uh, had, when you describe what he was doing, uh, the Gödel numbers were numerals uh, that functioned as names of sentences, of formulae, so that anything, any sentence in piano arithmetic could be associated with a unique uh, number and you could go back and forth between them. And Tarski had the idea that uh, these were metalinguistic. These were names in a meta language for expressions in an object language. Uh, Gödel came up with this idea, but not with the concept of what he was doing. This is just what he did. Uh, but Tarski had the idea that uh, this was a, a meta language. And he and Karnak went in somewhat different directions with that idea. Uh, Karnak, in the logical syntax of language, uh, stayed with the notion of syntactic meta languages. Uh, but his idea there was uh, some expressions that look to be object language expressions are covertly metalinguistic. Uh, Tarski uh, had the idea that, that in addition to syntactic metalanguages, there could be semantic metalanguages. And in his famous essay on the concept of truth, 
Uh, so, well, really truth is a metalinguistic concept. We need to think about it in a language where we've got names for the sentences of the object language. And this is a predicate that can apply to those names. It's true. And uh, he could resolve uh, various semantic paradoxes by looking at the hierarchy of semantic metalanguages. Uh, this is all happening in the early mid thirties. Uh, by the early forties, uh, Carnap has come around and said, oh yeah, they're semantic meta languages too. Uh, but already in the logical syntax of language, uh, uh, Carnap had uh, used the idea of covertly metalinguistic expressions. His term in that book is quasi-syntactic, but I think it's better to think about them as uh, covertly metalinguistic. He said, some things that have been puzzling to philosophers perennially, uh, like universals, uh, really aren't puzzling at all if you think about them in terms of their character as metalinguistic. So, you know, the uh, medievals and the debates about universals worried about what you were saying when you said triangularity is a property. Uh, what is triangularity and uh, what are properties? Uh, in addition to triangular things, there's triangularity, what is that? And Carnap said, understand it this way. Uh, saying triangularity is a property is saying in material mode, exactly what you can say in formal mode, that is in an explicitly syntactic Meta language. When you say is triangular, that predicate is a one place predicate. That's what you're saying when you say that uh, triangularity is a property. You're classifying this expression as a one place predicate. Um, so, uh, project from logical syntax of language, understand uh, philosophically puzzling concepts as uh, the ones that are legitimate and where there is a real use to this, understand them as metalinguistic. And just appreciate that sometimes uh, it looks as though we're talking about the world, but we're really talking about our talk uh, about the world. And sellers, uh, takes this idea and runs with it. But, so for instance, his nominalism about um, uh, universals worked out in uh, these three fabulous essays of 1960 on abstract entities, uh, is really working out that idea of Carnap's, responding to the sort of obvious objections. When I say triangularity is a property, I'm not talking about the English term triangular rather than some other one. Uh, Sellers showed how we could fix all that up. But Sellers could see, as Carnap could not, that in coming up with this idea of uh, metalinguistic expressions, Carnap had a version of Kantian categories that uh, in particular, the what's expressed by the subjunctive mood, by subjunctive conditionals, by talk about law, lawfulness or, or necessity in alethic modal vocabulary uh, is covertly metalinguistic. Sellers says early on, I'll be interpreting the statement that all A's are necessarily B's as a rule for the use of the expressions A and B to say all copper necessarily uh, conducts electricity is to endorse a rule that says you can infer uh, the electrical conductivity of something from uh, its being copper. Uh, in effect, the way I think you should put it is what you're doing when you say uh, everything copper conducts electricity, what you're doing uh, is endorsing a rule of inference. Uh, now that's something that's in 
a pragmatic meta vocabulary, and the early sellers had uh, had such a notion, which uh, Tarski and Carnap uh, did not. But Sellers' view was the new way of words is a way to make sense in the mid 20th century of Kantian categories, of framework explicating concepts. They're metalinguistic concepts. That's the way Kant talked about uh, ground level activities of knowing and acting. And I think this is right. I, I think uh, the way to think about the topic that uh, Kant and Hegel spend most of their time talking about, the concepts, the philosophical concepts that they talk about, Hegel's speculative, uh, begreiflich concepts, uh, the philosophical, the logical concepts, is as uh, metalinguistic as these are the concepts we use to make explicit uh, features of the framework within which we apply ground level uh, concepts. Now, having discovered this new kind of concept, Kant talks a lot more about those than he does about how to actually use them to understand the use of terms like copper. I mean, he does do that, but how uh, most of the ink is spent on understanding these new, uh, these new concepts he's uh, uh, discovered. Never mind the concepts of reason uh, going uh, beyond that. And Hegel too spends very little time talking about uh, concepts like copper, ground level concepts. What he's interested in is the concepts we use to make explicit the framework within which we can describe something as copper, can know that it's copper or judge uh, that it's copper. Concepts like uh, uh, how things objectively are in themselves, as opposed to how they show up for consciousness. Uh, the, the sorts of concepts that we use to articulate uh, a semantic or epistemological picture of the sort that he articulates in the in that very first paragraph. And the method that I call semantic descent is to say, well, there's a special, given that these concepts are playing this distinctive expressive role, this broadly metalinguistic role, there's a special way we can understand them. We have, a, we have a, an inside route to understanding them because we can understand some view about these meta concepts by seeing what it lets us say about the use of the ground level concepts. So if we're puzzled about uh, some statement about uh, uh, Kant's categories, that's really the Hegelian version I care about here, uh, his uh, non-empirical concepts, his philosophical concepts, as he's going to consider different constellations of philosophical concepts, sense certainty, perception, understanding uh, uh, to begin with, to understand each of them, what we should look at is what does it say about uh, the use of ordinary ground level concepts? And that's the method of semantic descent, to understand uh, a system of uh, categorical concepts, uh, of logical concepts, in terms of the expressive power it gives us to say things about the use of ground level uh, concepts. That's going to be the philosophical payoff from, uh, as we see in the phenomenology, ever more adequate sets of meta concepts are gonna underwrite ever more adequate accounts of the use of ground level concepts. And what we wanna learn about in the end is how we should talk and think about the use of ground level concepts. That's the philosophical topic, their use in 
knowing and in acting. Uh, what's the philosophical story about that that's told at uh, the meta level? So clearly that opening paragraph uh, is happening at a meta-conceptual level. He's saying, if you think about conceptualizing the unconceptual, the non-conceptual, if you think about effing the ineffable, uh, putting the ineffable into effable that is conceptual shape, uh, if you think about it that way, at the meta level, uh, you're not going to be able to tell an intelligible story about how we can uh, how we can know things. And so let's try uh, uh, something else. Now, uh, as a result, uh, I look at the account of the experience of error in the middle part of the introduction and say, well, let's think about how this works for ground level concepts. Uh, and then see him as saying, well, actually, it works the same way for meta-level uh, concepts. But let's understand it from below. Uh, and throughout the book, I'm going to be looking at uh, Hegel's philosophical concepts. He says, well, this one turns out to be inadequate, and it's replaced by this next one. And I'm going to be looking, well, what does the one, the first one, not let us say? about the use of the ground level concepts that the second one does let us uh, say, uh, but focus on what it's teaching us about concept use at the ground, uh, at the ground level. Uh, now, uh, this picture of uh, the distinction between what I'll call the ground level, ordinary empirical descriptive and practical uh, uh, concepts on the one hand and concepts in a semantic and pragmatic meta vocabulary for talking about uh, their use. Um, Hegel thinks right off the bat, there's a distinction between the way Kant thinks about them and the way Hegel does. Uh, Kant thinks there's just one set of these, the categories uh, on the cognitive uh, side, uh, once and for all, uh, that's what there is. Whereas Hegel thinks they're evolving, uh, that uh, we get a set of meta concepts that gives us some grip on what's going on, but uh, can't be brought into reflective equilibrium between what we're saying about it using those meta concepts and what we actually see going on in the, in the practice. Uh, and that lack of reflective equilibrium leads us to change the uh, meta concepts. And uh, it's a rehearsal of that history uh, of the change of them. Well, a rehearsal that's rationally reconstructed uh, so as to be expressively progressive, as that's recollected. That's what the phenomenology consists in, and in its own way, the science of logic uh, does. But we see these things as evolving, as changing. He says, if you think about the, met the meta concepts the first way, you're using meta categories, that is, meta meta concepts of Verstand. And if you think about the meta concepts as dynamic, as evolving, as becoming more expressively adequate in the way Hegel does, you're applying meta categories, that is meta meta concepts uh, of the kind he calls Vernunft. And a general characterization of what he's doing in the book is teaching us how to think beyond uh, the meta categories of Verstand uh, and adopt the meta categories of Vernunft, that will be uh, achieving philosophical self consciousness uh, of the kind he calls absolute knowing. That will be the final form of uh, philosophical self consciousness, is when 
uh, we're using uh, categories that we understand uh, according to the meta categories of Vernunft rather than uh, Verstand. And now here I want to say, um, Hegel is working with this distinction between what he calls determinate concepts. That's what I'm calling the ground level concepts, concepts like copper uh, and philosophical concepts. Um, and the word in German for concept is begriff. Uh, his adjective is begreiflich, uh, almost always translated as speculative, uh, but uh, it's, um, uh, that's the second category of concepts. Uh, and he says, look, uh, these two kinds of concepts are alike in one way and are different in one way. Uh, and now I'm retailing uh, or gesturing at the story I tell in the uh, sketch of a program for a uh, critical reading uh, of Hegel. Uh, he says they're alike in that uh, ground level concepts uh, evolve uh, through the experience of error, which is a failure of a certain kind of reflective equilibrium. Uh, a paradigm of that, uh, this is an example from early Sellers uh, uh, that I'll uh, appeal to when we talk about the experience of error. Uh, I have a toy concept of an acid, uh, which has the circumstances of appropriate application that include that anything that tastes sour is an acid and, in, and among its consequences of application, it includes that if it's an acid, then it'll turn litmus paper red. Uh, but now as I go around applying this concept correctly, according to, to those norms, uh, I find something that tastes sour, but turns litmus paper blue. Uh, and so it's led me to, to commitments that are incompatible by my own lights. And that's telling me, well, you can't have this concept. This concept curls up in it an implication, a consequence that anything that's sour will turn litmus paper red. And that consequence doesn't hold necessarily. It's not a lawful consequence in the world. Uh, you've built this mistake into your concept. You've got to have a different concept. And so maybe I say, oh, well, it's only clear liquids that taste sour that are acids. And so we'll turn litmus paper blue and uh, that works for a while and so on. Um, it is really the only way to convey the content of uh, uh, a ground level concept uh, is by a recollection of it, by a rehearsal of the history of how we got to, uh, of how we got to where we are uh, uh, using it uh, as we do. Uh, looking for a passage here. Um, Yeah, uh, and similarly for these meta categories, these philosophical concepts, uh, you can't, as Kant tries to do, define them. Uh, that is a Verstand level picture where we've got these concepts that we use in the definition that have their static sharp boundaries and we build them together to, to get something equivalent to uh, our philosophical concept. So uh, Kant says, uh, here's the definition of virtue. Kant says, virtue is a readiness in lawful actions that are done freely, combined with moral strength in pursuit of these with struggle against obstacles. Classic. Kantian definition, every piece of it is doing uh, some work for him. Uh, what work is it doing? Well, Kant defines everything. So he defines definition 
Now, a definition is a verbal formulation distinguishing the concept from all others by a set of necessary and sufficient marks. Basically, it's giving necessary and sufficient conditions. It's giving truth conditions. Hegel says, really, you can't define uh, concepts uh, because the most you could accomplish with that is uh, a snapshot of a time slice of them. Uh, but if you want to convey the content of them, you've got to rehearse. Well, we tried this concept and it didn't work because of this. Uh, you've got to do what the recollecting judge does in conveying the content of a legal concept uh, and explain inter alia how we got to mean this uh, by it. And he thinks that's true of ground level concepts and of the meta. Uh, uh, and of the meta concepts. But he also thinks there's a difference uh, between them. And the difference is that the ground level concepts, uh, their evolution is open-ended. Uh, it's never going to stop. The notion of temperature or of, con or of copper uh, or of acid, uh, we're gonna keep finding uh, refinements that are necessary uh, for it. This process whereby we discovered that we couldn't have that first toy concept of acid, that never stops. That's what, uh, that's how we should understand the conceptual inexhaustibility of sensuous immediacy is that by correctly applying a constellation of determinate empirical concepts, correctly applying them according to the norms that are their meanings, we will never be uh, we will never find a stable resting place whereby continuing to apply them, we don't sooner or later end up with commitments that are incompatible by our own lights. Uh, this is the this is the uh, way in which sensuous immediacy manifests itself as an element in conceptual content. It's the restless uh, uh, instability of empirical concepts. Oh. Here I think, and he's contrasting this with a view that Kant shared with his empiricist predecessors, which said, uh, no, we understand the way in which the conceptual can't fully capture sensuous immediacy, uh, not in terms of the instability of concepts. The concepts are fine, uh, but just in the inexhaustibility of uh, the deliverances of sense by judgment. So if you look at your hand, uh, you start making empirical judgments about it, uh, you'll never finish. There will always be things that you can see that you haven't said yet. It's an infinite task to uh, conceptualize uh, this. I may have successfully synthesized this manifold of intuition by using the dog concept, but I get to an anomaly. Now I can't successfully synthesize it under that rule. I put that concept back on the shelf and pull the fox uh, concept off. The concepts are all all right, but uh, uh, I might make judgments uh, forever. Here, I think, uh, interestingly, uh, in understanding the way in which immediacy outruns the conceptual as being a dynamic source of instability of concepts, a source of change in them, rather than just in the infinite task of more and more judgments. Uh, Hegel is seeing the Quinean and Wittgensteinian point that uh, when we change our beliefs, we have to change our meanings too. That change of meaning and change of belief are two sides of one coin. And the old view 
that we can fix the meanings once and for all of our ground level concepts and of our higher level concepts. Uh, that's the view that we can fix the norms. The concepts are norms for believing. Uh, and our attitudes will be bound by those norms. That's the traditional understanding of the relation between statuses and attitudes, that uh, one can fix the norms, the concepts, the meanings, uh, and then those set standards for the correct application of beliefs. But the modern appreciation of the attitude dependence of norms, of normative statuses, says, well, no, a given sequence of beliefs can oblige you to change your concepts, as in this toy case of uh, the acid, sour, and blue. That's an, in, that, that's an instance of the modern insight that our attitudes, in this case our beliefs, can change our meanings, uh, that we need to be thinking about sort of both sides um, uh, of that. So remember I said last time that I was going to understand uh, Hegel is seeing the one big thing that happened in human history, the change from traditional to modern forms of life um, in terms of a shift of the structure of normativity, that is of Geist, uh, from uh, a one-sided appreciation of the attitude dependence of normative statuses, the traditional view, to, in the modern case, a one-sided appreciation of uh, the attitude dependence of normative statuses, uh, which will bring us to the third stage when we see those as two sides of one coin. Uh, here, uh, in thinking about the instability of concepts, uh, uh, of determinate concepts, and the instability of, um, sorry, thinking about the instability of uh, ground level concepts, that's an instance of this modern insight, but uh, applied to semantics. But uh, I said, Hegel thinks there's a way in which determinate concepts and philosophical concepts are alike. Uh, to convey their content, you can't give static definitions. You've got to give a recollection, a rational, uh, retrospective rational reconstruction of an expressively progressive uh, way in which the norm gradually became explicit uh, uh, for us. He also says there's a way in which they're different. And that is that he still thinks that at the end of the day, Kant is right. There can be one fully adequate set of philosophical concepts. Uh, when we get those, uh, those are the concepts of Vernunft, uh, those are the concepts of the system, the system, uh, not his system, he insists. It's the system. It's the concepts that we come to by the end of the phenomenology, which are set out a different way in uh, the science of logic. That he thinks uh, they're uh, where determinate concepts will evolve forever, the speculative concepts need. And I in that essay that I referred to, the sketch, uh, my sketch of a program for a critical reading is to say, yeah, he was wrong about both those uh, features. He was wrong in thinking that determinate and philosophical concepts are alike in that uh, the only way in principle to convey them is to uh, re is recollectively by a narrative uh, of a distinctive sort rather than by a definition. He's wrong about that because we have the method of semantic descent for understanding philosophical concepts. We have another route for understanding their content, seeing what they have to say about determinate concepts. And that's the method that I take to explicate Hegel's ideas, is that notion of some, that method of semantic descent. And I'll say, and this is not immediately relevant here, but just to, uh, to register it. And I think he's wrong really by his own lights in thinking that the speculative concepts will eventually get a fully adequate set of them. That systematicity, 
I think there's always more uh, redescriptions of the ground use of the ground level concepts, more to be made explicit uh, there as there is for the, uh, for the others. But that, that point is not so, um, uh, so relevant here. So, uh, although uh, the phenomenology is about the evolution of philosophical concepts, in the first part of it, the evolution of shapes of consciousness, uh, we're going to give uh, a science of the experience of consciousness of the way in which uh, uh, the concepts that articulate our self-consciousness, our understanding of what we're doing in applying concepts, uh, uh, applying determinate concepts, the way in which that uh, falls short of reflective equilibrium and moves us to a more adequate set, uh, those I'm gonna understand by semantic descent, by looking at what each one of them says about uh, the use of the ground level uh, concepts. No one else reads Hegel that way. Uh, he conducts his discussion at the level of the categorical concepts, and that's the way people read him. And my overarching strategy is to say, let's understand what he says at that level by thinking about what each constellation of meta concepts uh, can and can't say. Uh, uh, about what's going on at the ground level and how its incapacity to be adequate in expressing what's at the ground level uh, then leads us to a slightly more adequate uh, uh, account. But let's look at it by understanding what it's saying about uh, empirical judgment and practical agency when we get to... Uh, uh, to the reason uh, section that's about practical agency. So uh, this is bringing in uh, uh, a picture of the relation between philosophical uh, concepts and determinate level concepts that I derive from my reading of Seller's reading of Carnap in relation to Kant. Uh, so at some distance. And yet I'm saying there are things going on in the Hegel text that you can only understand if you uh, read it through this, uh, through this lens. Uh, and that's why I talk about seeing the stick looking bent in the water and seeing that it's straight in my discussion of the introduction where Hegel is talking at the meta level about uh, the science of the experience of consciousness at the meta level and the experience of uh, error there. Uh, John McDowell, who vehemently disapproves of uh, this way, way of reading Hegel, uh, uh, says that I've lost sight of in the reading of in my reading of the introduction of Hegel's introduction being an introduction to the book that it's actually an introduction to, uh, which is conducted, the book is conducted entirely at the meta level. Uh, and you know, while appreciating what he means by that, why are you talking about stakes uh, instead of talking about what things are for consciousness and what they are in themselves? Um, I, th I think actually my reading is, uh, if anything, in the in my three chapters, bent out of shape by my wanting to uh, pack into the reading there already more of what's going on in the rest of the book that it's an introduction to than Hegel himself is bringing uh, into play. So, for instance, the uh, uh, bimodal hylomorphic uh, conceptual realism, which is his answer to the problem he sets out about representation uh, and uh, is gestured at in the discussion of the experience of error, but it's not 
that happens later in the book, but I think it's helpful to uh, bring it in uh, here. So, um, anything anybody wants to say about uh, this? How, uh, you know, when I was talking about the styles of hermeneutics, I said the main thing is to be explicit about what the rules of the game you're playing are, about, about what hermeneutic strategy you are uh, pursuing. Uh, and this semantic descent, which depends on a certain view of what Kantian categories and Hegelian uh, philosophical concepts are, um, uh, is what drives my, uh, my reading. Okay, uh, why don't we take uh, our break? Uh, I have 256, why don't we come back at 310? Well, welcome back, uh, everybody. <clears throat> so what I wanna talk about next is, uh, the sketch Hegel gives us of how we can think about things. Uh, if we're not gonna have uh, the two-stage two -stage differential intelligibility uh, picture of uh, our needing to conceptualize the unconceptual and non-conceptual uh, in order to represent it, what story are we gonna tell? Uh, and I said, generically, we can think of this as uh, him saying, instead of taking these two supposedly independent things and independently intelligible uh, and bolting them together to get a story about the intentional nexus, semantically uh, the possibility of genuine knowledge, uh, let's start inside the process of knowing, uh, the process of applying empirical concepts uh, and, and understand the functional roles that are being played by um, the two sides of the intentional uh, of the intentional nexus. Now, Hegel says, if we just look at consciousness, uh, we see that there's a distinction between, uh, there's a distinction within it between what things are in themselves, what things objectively are, how it is with the thing that is known on the one hand and our knowing of it, uh, what things are for us uh, on the other hand. Uh, texts here are from paragraphs 84 and 85. Uh, I think that's 13 and 14 in the um, dove numbering. What we want to understand is how, he, as he says in 84, consciousness provides itself with its own standard. How in what consciousness within its own self designates as the in itself or the true, we have the standard by which consciousness itself proposes to measure its knowledge. Now here parenthetically, uh, uh, recall that I said, uh, I think, in both of the previous sessions, that one of the ideas Hegel learns from Kant, uh, and you know, it's, it's much more explicit in Hegel than it is in Kant, though I think he's right to find it in Kant, uh, is to think of uh, the relation between representatives and representings in normative terms, to think of what's represented as exercising a kind of authority over. Uh, the correctness of uh, representings, uh, which count as representings of that represented, just insofar as they're responsible in assessments of their correctness to how it is uh, with that thing. And here he's using this language. He's saying how within what consciousness itself designates as the in itself, we have the standard by which consciousness proposes to measure its knowledge. Uh, a normative standard of correctness. You can say we're going to find that inside 
uh, consciousness itself. How is it that, oh, sentence from 85, the difference between the in itself and the for itself is already present in the very fact that consciousness knows an object at all. Something is to it, the in itself, but the knowledge or the being of the object for consciousness is to it still another moment. Now, here uh, we're getting uh, uh, a key move, uh, which earlier translators of uh, the phenomenology missed. It's not in Bailey, it's not in Miller. Dove was really the first one to do it, uh, both uh, Inwood and um, Pinkard in the current version of Pinkard uh, uh, recognize this. We have a distinction between what things are in themselves, the object of knowledge, and what things are merely for consciousness. A distinction between reality and appearance, he's saying is already part of what we uh, experience. Those are two roles something can play to consciousness. Uh, the reason the earlier uh, translators missed this is that there's explicit uh, prepositions, uh, an sich for in itself and for Bewusstsein, for uh, consciousness. But, the, but this point that those are distinctions to consciousness is just made by using a dative pronoun. They are to it, im. Um, so there isn't an explicit pronoun there. Uh, it was Dove's uh, innovation to uh, say, look, uh, he's talking about these as roles things can play to consciousness. They can be to consciousness, either what things are in themselves or what they are for consciousness. So far, we haven't seen how that could be. How could that distinction fall inside consciousness? Uh, in 85, again, consciousness is on the one hand, consciousness of the object and on the other consciousness of itself. Consciousness of what to it is the true and consciousness of its knowledge of the truth. So he wants this distinction between appearance and reality to be funded from inside uh, experience. And he's going to do that by looking at uh, the way our views change, uh, looking at the experience of consciousness uh, as our commitments change under the impact of uh, empirical uh, experience, uh, in particular, as we find ourselves having made mistakes. That's what uh, drives everything. Uh, his name for the process by which uh, sequentially we find one set of commitments by its own internal lights being inadequate uh, and repair that and move to another and then understand retrospectively what we've done, he calls that experience of foul. Um, And it's in the experience of error that the subject consciousness is, again, in 85, consciousness of what to it is the true and consciousness of its knowledge of this truth. Since both are for consciousness, well, officially he should say to uh, consciousness here, consciousness itself is their comparison. Whether its knowledge of the object corresponds or fails to correspond with this object will be a matter for consciousness itself. So that's, that's what we have to understand. And uh, uh, I'm suggesting that the way to understand that is to think about the experience of ordinary empirical error uh, and then see him as saying, yeah, well, and the same thing can happen for uh, meta concepts as well as for ground level determinate concepts. Now, uh, a couple of minutes ago, I was... Uh, outlining this uh, Solarsian example of uh, how we could, by our own lights, find that our concept uh, of an acid uh, was inadequate. Uh, by correctly applying it and our color concepts and our taste concepts, uh, uh, we find ourselves with commitments that by our own lights 
are materially incompatible with each other. Uh, on the one hand, we're looking at the litmus paper and we see that it's blue. On the other hand, we've inferred from the fact that it's an acid because it tasted sour. We've inferred that it's red and uh, being blue and being red are materially uh, incompatible by our own lights. So by correctly applying these concepts according to their norms, uh, we found ourselves with commitments that by our own lights are incompatible. Now that's an example of uh, how things can lead to change of the inferential commitments that articulate our conception. Uh, the example uh, that I use in making it explicit is of a change of belief where, uh, you know, a uh, classic uh, 17th century example, I'm looking at the uh, stick in the water and it looks bent. Uh, at the surface of the water, and I pull it out, and I see that it's straight, uh, and I have background commitments that moving the stick didn't change it from uh, bent to straight. That isn't how you can uh, affect uh, sticks like that. So I have incompatible commitments. I believed that it's straight, and now I'm looking at it, I believe that it's, uh, sorry, I thought it was bent. I'm looking at it now, it's straight. Uh, by my own lights, those are uh, incompatible commitments. And I mentioned that Hegel thinks about these ground level concepts that in principle, there cannot be uh, a set of determinate empirical concepts such that by applying them correctly by their own lights, one will not be led sooner or later to uh, commitments that are incompatible according to those same norms. He thinks it's inevitable that that will happen. That's what the richness uh, of uh, the objective, the empirical richness of the objective world tells us uh, as uh, he's rendering it. But uh, he wants us to think about this change of belief. So uh, I give up the claim that the stick is bent in favor of the claim that it's uh, straight. Well, uh, I'm now contrasting my current commitment to the uh, sticks being straight, which to me is the way things really are. That's what I've discovered is that the stick really is straight. And I'm contrasting that with my prior commitment, doxastic commitment, judgment, to uh, the sticks being bent. And I'm saying, oh, that prior commitment, that was just an appearance. That was not the way things are, the way the stick is really objectively in itself. Uh, that was just the way it was for consciousness. Uh, the experience of error, of finding myself with incompatible commitments at the first stage of the experience of error, and then resolving that somehow. In this case, I change my belief. Uh, in the case of the, in the acid case, I change the concept. So instead of changing a doxastic commitment, I change an inferential commitment. Uh, anyway, I'm normatively obliged to change something because I find myself with commitments that are incompatible by my own lights, ones that I cannot, by my own norms, be entitled to. And so, you know, I've got to change, uh, I've got to change something. But in that experience of being normatively obliged to change, uh, I'm distinguishing between how things really are and how they uh, merely are for consciousness. It's that temporal sequence that makes it possible for me to so much as think that uh, the way things are for me contrasts potentially with the way they really are. It's because I discovered that this particular way things were for me uh, was just an appearance and not uh, the reality. This is going to be the way, I'm just gonna put this enigmatic uh, remark out there, this is going to be the way that is by 
uh, focusing on the process of development, the temporal process of uh, giving up a claim that one has endorsed, uh, to see that as a historical process uh, is going to be the way Hegel schematizes his philosophical concepts, sees them as essentially temporally, historically articulated. Uh, and this is, if you look at uh, Heidegger's discussion of these 16 paragraphs uh, in a, sem in a semester-long seminar that he gave uh, on them, uh, which the translation, which is published under the title, um, Hegel's Concept of Experience, by Heidegger, which is where uh, the Kenley Dove translation first uh, you know, was commissioned uh, for. Uh, Heidegger, very interested in the temporality. Uh, you know, he'd written his Kant book about the concept of time in uh, the first critique. And uh, that's what he's interested in is this um, uh, appearance, first appearance of time, temporality, historicity in uh, the concept of experience here. Now, uh, I want to say something about this uh, notion of a distinction between the way things are in themselves and the way they merely are for me being something practically to me in uh, the experience of error uh, that I don't say in the three chapters in uh, A Spirit of Trust, that it connects with the topic I only come back to in chapter eight there, where I'm discussing the opening chapters, uh, the, the opening paragraphs of uh, chapter four, the self-consciousness chapter of the phenomenology where we're told uh, that the origin of consciousness is in desire, uh, in biological desire. And the story that I tell there, we'll come, come back to this in, in a couple of weeks, but uh, here's the quick sketch of it, is that uh, by contrast to a two-factor stimulus response, behavioristic picture, Hegel sees in desire a triadic uh, structure. If we think of the paradigm as hunger, there's the desire, hunger, there's the significance that something can have relative to desire. Uh, if I respond to the hunger by eating this fruit, I'm treating it as food. Oh, that's, and, and there's the activity, which is the eating, which is motivated by uh, the hunger. So we have the hunger, that's the desire, the activity, the eating, and then the significance that something has when my activity is directed uh, against it. I'm treating it as food by eating it. But crucially, desire includes a proto-normative standard of correctness. If the fruit is disgusting, uh, or even just if it's not nourishing, I spit it out and find out what? That it didn't actually have the status I took it to have. That it was food only for me. It appeared to be food, but it wasn't really because it doesn't satisfy the desire. Uh, I engaged in the activity to satisfy the desire and it didn't work. It's experience of error in this desiring uh, animal. And we can already see the proto form of the distinction to it practically between what the thing really was and what it took it to be. It took it to be food, but the fact that it didn't satisfy its desire uh, taught it that it wasn't really food, that that was merely an appearance to it. 
in biological desire, which I see he already has a much more sophisticated conceptual structure here than Skinnerian behaviorists and operant conditioning people had. Those were just two factors, um, stimulus and response. And although it was you know, an account of learning, uh, Hegel's giving it a richer, a richer structure here. Uh, but I think we can see a proto notion of, uh, you know, there's nothing conceptual about uh, this. It's a practical significance of uh, food uh, that it uh, has. But in the same way, something kind of the practical significance of prey or predator or you know, fleeing from it or hiding from it is the, uh, is the right thing to do. And he's already going to say that's the practical appearance to uh, the creature of this distinction between appearance and reality. And it comes in the experience of error. It's when you change your attitude. So now this fruit no longer has the practical significance to you of food uh, that it had relative, uh, relative to your desire. So uh, this is the way he can see uh, a distinction between appearance and reality, between how things are for me uh, and how they actually are, how they are in themselves. As arising within experience, if we think of experience as this process that necessarily includes uh, getting things wrong, getting things wrong by our own lights. I say this is why the, the engine of our conceptual activity is determinate negation, incompatibility, material incompatibility of red and blue, of bent and uh, straight, uh, uh, of nourishing and not nourishing, or hunger satisfying and not uh, hunger satisfying. Um, in the conceptual case, uh, we're going to see that the experience has uh, three phases. There's the acknowledgement of the incompatibility. Okay, I've uh, found myself with commitments that are incompatible by my own uh, by my own lights. Uh, there's the response to then the normative demand. Well, do something about it. You've got all these commitments that you yourself say you can't be entitled to all of them. So you know, get rid of some of them, change them, groom the concepts. Or change by changing your meaning, or change your uh, belief, change your doxastic commitments, or change your inferential commitments. The relations of inclusion and exclusion that articulate these uh, conceptions, and then the third phase, in which you look back at what happened uh, and say, "Well, I see that all along what I was talking about, the reality." behind my appearance, the reality of which it was an appearance was the straight stick. Um, that was what was really setting the standard of correctness of uh, my representings of it. Now in retrospect, I can see that that's what I was looking at, what I was talking about. That's what I was representing was the straight stick. And I can see that I misrepresented it as bent. Now I take it, I've got it right. But of course, the next cycle of experience will say, well, but you got it wrong in some other way. It turns out it wasn't a stick. After all, it was a piece of metal or uh, whatever. Yeah, Sequoia. Yeah, um, I'm interested in, in what you're saying about the uh, experience of er error and the two stick uh, example and this idea of a new object. Would it be fair to say in Hegelian, like if we were to extend what Hegel is saying, would it be fair to say that the new object of knowledge in this case would be a new standard, uh, a new normative standard that applies to, for instance, light refraction, right? Is that the kind of new object we would have where all of a sudden, because the stick has been taken out, uh, we now see it to be one stick that's straight. We saw that there was uh, a condition under which it is bent. 
and we see this new object to be how light refracts in water, for instance. Would that be fair, uh, a way of understanding this idea of a new object that you're, uh, that you're pushing? Yes, but not quite, I must say. So uh, what, what Sequoia is talking about is the, uh, these puzzling passages at the very end where he says, Oh, uh, look at, oh, uh, in 85. So something is to it, the in itself, but the knowledge of the being of the object for consciousness is to it still another moment, okay? It is upon this differentiation which exists and is present at hand that the examination, Hufung, is grounded the normative assessment. And if in this comparison, the two moments don't correspond, then it seems that consciousness will have to alter its knowledge in order to bring it in accord with the object. Uh, the object is a straight stick and it seems, well, I have to change my knowledge and take it to be straight. That's the common sense way of thinking about it. But he says, don't think about it that way. Uh, it's, Will, will give you a better understanding of things if you think that when your knowing of it changed, the object you knew changed. It's not the object that was the same all along and your knowledge of it uh, changing. Parenthetically, retrospectively, you'll be able to see that. But before that, see this emergence of what he calls the second new true object here in 85. Uh, the alteration of knowledge, however, the object itself becomes to consciousness, something which has in fact been altered as well. For the knowledge which existed was essentially a knowledge of the object. With a change in the knowledge, the object also becomes another, since it was an essential part of this knowledge. Hence, it comes to pass for consciousness that what had been to it, the in itself, is not in itself, or what was in itself is so only for consciousness. When, when therefore consciousness finds its knowledge not corresponding with its object, the object itself will also give way. In other words, the standard, Maßstab, of the examination is changed if that whose standard it was supposed to be fails to endure the course of the examination. And then in, 80, in 86, um, consciousness knows something, and this object is the essence or the in itself. But this object is also the in itself for consciousness. He should say two. Hence, the ambiguity of this truth comes into play. We see that consciousness now has two objects. One is the first in itself, and the second is the being for consciousness of this in itself. The latter seems at first to be merely the reflection of consciousness into itself, a representation not of an object, but only of its knowledge of the first object. But as already indicated, the first object, the in itself, comes to be altered for consciousness in this very process. It ceases to be the in itself and becomes to consciousness an object which is the in itself only for it and that should be for it. And therefore it follows that this, the being for consciousness of this in itself is the true, which is to say that this true is the essence or consciousness's new object. The new object contains the annihilation of the first, it's the experience constituted through that first object. Okay, here I think the key thing is, we're inclined to think of things, he acknowledges that Oh, uh, first there was the bent stick. And then because of the way things were out there, uh, we threw that away and acquired a new object, the straight stick, which replaced it. And that straight stick is the new true object. And he's saying, don't think about it that way. That's not the key point though there will be a perspective, the retrospective perspective from which that's true. He said, think about it at phase two rather than phase three 
of the knowledge. The object is your, is the way you took things to be, is the bent stick, the stick as bent, we could say. It changed status, that stick as bent. Its status was to consciousness, how things are in themselves. That was the reality before this episode of error. Now, what is it now? The stick as bent. It's changed status. It's changed to having the status to consciousness of merely being an appearance. That change of status from being to consciousness, what things are in themselves, to being to consciousness, merely an appearance. The new true object that, that emerged is not the straight stick. It's the bent stick as appearance rather than the bent stick as the way things are in themselves. So he's saying focus on the change of status of that commitment of yours from being to you something you endorsed, an attitude of yours as how things really are, to having the, to you this other status. Uh, oh, merely an appearance of something else. That was merely an attitude of mine. It's changed from being, uh, from having the status of um, being to you veridical to the status of being to you a mere appearance of something else. So uh, he, he thinks it's important that we have this other perspective uh, on things because that change of status, that's the experience of error. That's what gives us the distinction between uh, the way things are in themselves and the way they are uh, for consciousness. Uh, it's in that change of normative status from being endorsed to not being endorsed. That's the origin of uh, representation, of the idea that our uh, commitments answer for their correctness to something outside of them that they might get wrong. Uh, it's in the possibility of that shift uh, in the status of a commitment, uh, that, that, uh, that the essence of representation is to be found. If we ask, well, how is it we get our minds around the idea? Where did we get the idea that our thoughts are about something, uh, that they represent something, that they answer for their correctness to something beyond themselves? And he says, if you want to understand that, think about what you have to do to practically appreciate it. And what you have to do is change the status of this commitment you had. Uh, when you see that the very same commitment, the very same content can be now endorsed and now not be endorsed for reasons having to do with your other commitments that it's not endorsed, and so shows up as merely the appearance of something else. That's our practical, the origin of our practical grasp on the idea that our thought is about something. And that's what we're going to articulate in the meta theory, uh, what we need adequate meta concepts to understand is that uh, uh, basic practical phenomenon. And so these puzzling um, passages about how when our knowing changes, what's known changes too. What's known there is the stick is bent and it changes status from being to consciousness, how things are in themselves to being to consciousness, merely what things were for consciousness. Uh, a mistaken appearance, but a mistaken appearance of something, of what there is in um, itself. So his strategy is uh, to say, look, if we think about the experience of empirical error, uh, 
being normatively obliged by our own, by the norms that we endorse that articulate our, the contents of our commitments, being normatively obliged to change things. If we think about that and particularly think about that change, uh, the change of status of a commitment that we relinquished, an endorsement that we no longer uh, make, an attitude that we no longer have toward this content, uh, that change of attitude. That's the essence of the intentional nexus. That's the way we can think about the functional roles played in that experience of what things are in themselves and what they are for consciousness, where the one represents the other in the sense that uh, it's responsible for assessments of its correctness to how it is with the other. And that understanding is the third stage of uh, the experience of error. When we look back and say, okay, I see implicitly what we were representing all along, the way things are in themselves so far is the straight stick. It always was the straight stick. Uh, but it appeared to me as uh, a bent stick. And then I discovered that it was straight by responding to these collateral uh, commitments in this way. Uh, and I want to say, each successive judge uh, has to recollect, well, that episode of experience, and then the next one where, uh, you know, I hit the stick with a horseshoe and it made a sound that wood cannot make. And so I realized that that too was uh, an appearance of uh, a metal bar that uh, I had mistaken uh, the rust for the bark uh, uh, of a stick. So uh, he's giving us the alternative strategy that he's going to, to use. Uh, look, looking prospectively uh, at this process of experience, we see the change of status of uh, the very same content. Looked at retrospectively, we can see that as uh, the emergence into greater explicitness of what was implicitly there all along, normatively governing the evolution of uh, our commitments. That is, as the objective, uh, as the objective world. So he he's uh, sketching the structure of an account of how the representational dimension of conceptual content can arise from the fact that the significance of uh, two concepts being materially incompatible is that if you find yourself with commitments to both, you're normatively obliged to give one of them up or to change the boundaries of them, to, to change something. Uh, the notion of representation is an explanatory posit uh, in our retrospective understanding of the evolution of uh, our attitudes. Uh, and recollective rationality is this um, uh, is the process that articulates this notion of expression of the implicit in um, explicit form. So uh, what's going to happen with shapes of consciousness, uh, the, the first three that he has most in mind when he's writing this, uh, that'll come out in the next three, you know, in the first three chapters of the phenomenology, uh, the form of empirical self-consciousness, the form in which empirical consciousness understands itself that he calls sense certainty, uh, the form of empirical self-consciousness he calls perception and the form that he calls understanding. Uh, each of them is going to, uh, in conceptualizing the experience of error, uh, is going to 
find itself with commitments that are incompatible by its own lights in the meta language, uh, which are a failure of reflective equilibrium between what it says about some particular course of experience and the terms that it's using to talk about it. Uh, the evolution of shapes of empirical consciousness will be more like the acid case than the bent stick case in that it'll be a change of conception. Say, oh, well, this doesn't follow from this, or this is really incompatible uh, with that. Uh, but this is the process that uh, drives it. And uh, I, I think it clarifies uh, sort of what he's saying in these dark passages to think about them from below, to, to see that the description he's got is a perfectly sensible description of uh, our ordinary empirical experience. And now we can say, okay, he's claiming that uh, what he's going to be rehearsing and recollecting in the phenomenology itself is a process just like that, except for metaconceptions, <clears throat> for ways of understanding uh, empirical uh, consciousness. So that's the method of uh, semantic descent applied to uh, what goes on here. And uh, I hope we can see uh, at least the first glimmerings of the strategy for, as I say, thinking about objectivity and subjectivity uh, in terms of the roles they play in this process of experience, um, uh, which is a process of uh, committing ourselves and finding our commitments incompatible by our own lights and so normatively obliging us to change, to change them. Uh, that, that process is what uh, we're, we're gonna keep going back to. Uh, that's what he's rehearsing for us at the meta level. And that's what at each stage I'm gonna say, well, let's look at what each of those uh, views at the meta level can and can't say about what's happening at, uh, with our empirical and practical concepts at uh, the ground level. And the, the strategy of uh, beginning with th this holistic strategy uh, of beginning with uh, an articulated whole, uh, a practice, and thinking about the functional roles of different things in it, rather than uh, thinking about things that you can understand independently of one another, and then making claims about how they relate to each other. That's what he's thinking of as uh, what idealisms have in common with each other. Uh, and his idealism is going to be uh, historical, uh, socially uh, uh, articulated in the ways I gestured at. Um, uh, last time. Uh, in that sense, naturalized and brought down to earth from uh, the Kantian version uh, of it. But part of the advertisement for it is going to be, uh, on this account, uh, I'm going to make sense of the idea that we can know things as they actually are. Um, the thing it turns out we can know fully as it really is, is ourselves, self-consciousness, because oh, that self-consciousness tells us about the process of applying empirical concepts, that that's a never-ending process, that not only will we constantly find that we need to give up some of our beliefs, but we'll constantly find that our concepts are inadequate as well, that they need to be uh, changed. But we'll understand what we're doing in doing 
uh, all of that as the process of finding out how things really, uh, really are, even though we have to give up the idea of getting one finally correct set of beliefs and meanings. That's not what knowledge and truth consist in. In the uh, famous image from uh, the preface, uh, which uh, people love to contrast with other definitions of knowledge. Um, uh, he says, uh, the truth is a vast bacchanalian revel with not a soul sober, uh, where no sooner does one member of the company fall insensible below the table, beneath the table, than the place is taken by another. Um, and this is the picture of our concepts and commitments elbowing each other, that's their incompatibility, and one of them being pushed out, falling insensible below the table, but only because another one has uh, come in. Uh, the experience of error, he says, is uh, the, the turning of commitments we took to be veridical, they're un, being unmasked as uh, mere appearance uh, is the uh, arising and falling away that does not itself arise or fall away. That's what's uh, that's what's permanent. And retrospectively, we can see that as the process of finding out how things always already were, uh, but prospectively, it's the process of um, making new conceptions and new theories. Okay. Well, it would be worth rereading these 16 paragraphs sort of in the light of this, particularly the, the last bit, uh, and seeing how much more sense it makes in, uh, if read in this way. Um, for next week, uh, I've asked us to read the first two chapters, uh, the sense certainty and the perception chapter. Um, that's also two more chapters of the spirit of trust. Uh, use the handouts, the Humboldt lectures and so on to uh, do that. But uh, it, sort of in the interests of, sort of getting through it, uh, I'm gonna give rather short shrift to uh, sense certainty uh, in favor of perception, but the punchline is that uh, since certainty is the myth of the given, uh, and uh, uh, Sellers, who describes uh, empiricism and the philosophy of mind as uh, incipient meditation hegelienne, incipient hegelian meditations, uh, is acknowledging that uh, He's on the side of what he refers to in, in empiricism, the philosophy of mind of, uh, as that great foe of immediacy, uh, Hegel. Immediacy is the given, uh, mediation is, uh, is necessarily a conceptual um, aspect. Um, so uh, a quick, version of the story about perception uh, is uh, that, um, I guess I put up the version from a lecture I gave in Edinburgh uh, last term, uh, which is sort of the quickest way to see uh, how perception works and is an introduction to Hegelian negation. Uh, so I, I would recommend so viewing that, um, uh, if you can do nothing else, but um, that's for next time. Okay, well then uh, uh, we will be introduced to the science of the experience of consciousness uh, next week. Uh, be safe.